it is my very pleasure to be here with you today and uh, discuss uh, some of the latest development and a bit of a review of several of the aspects of non-traditional trademarks. As uh, Mrs. Martial just mentioned, um, I have uh, worked on non-traditional trademark considerably and in 2018 with my co-editor Professor St. Laban, we published a book uh, on non-traditional trademark that has been um, uh, published by Oxford University Press. I mentioned this here because this book is actually a book that is available for free to download to anybody interested. Um, this is the website and uh, you can uh, just go on the icon that says open access and click on it and you can download the old PDF of the book that has considerable amount of information about non-traditional trademarks um, at the international level, at the European level, at the United States level, um, and with other uh, comparative perspective. However, I also want to say that this is just the beginning of a longer project. I am very happy to be here today to you to discuss um, some of the developments, and I'm going to look particularly at the United States uh, because my co-speaker, um, Mr. Tom Clark, is going to talk more about non-traditional trademark in the EU. Um, but for example, as we know, and this webinar is primarily um, looking at um, the development um, as they will come in the ASEAN region, in Indonesia, Vietnam in particular, um, there is much work that will be done uh, in terms of changing the laws in this region, application and registration and examination in this region. And so many more books and many more surveys will be certainly developed, more focused on Asian law um, in, uh, you know, in the future. Um, it will be very much uh, my pleasure, in fact, to continue to working on this topic with you all. So first of all, I think when we talk about non-traditional trademarks, it's important to start with the terminology. We, based on the International Trademark Association definition, tend to use now more and more the terminology non-traditional trademarks or non-traditional marks. However, when we look at the international convention, primarily the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization treaties that discuss this type of trademarks and the work that the Standing Committee on Trademark within WIPO has done, the terminology has always uh, generally be being non-conventional trademarks. Then we also hear the terminology new type of marks. That's very much used within the European Union and all of this terminology in some way indicate the same. Marks that are non-traditional, that are new, that are different than the usual type of mark. We know that the usual type of mark tends to be more either word marks, as Adidas, Philips, um, you know, um, uh, Singapore Airline, Tiger Beer, um, or figurative, you know, we have logos, we have, you know, depiction, graphic elements, or a combination of graphic elements and words. On the other side, when we start to look at shapes or shapes containing word element, we start to enter into the less traditional, the non-traditional. Mm -hmm. um, we will see in a minute also a bit more of a classification of these marks, but I still consider the 3D marks as non-traditional, even if they might not be the not, not the newest type of marks. These are certainly very relevant within the non-traditional trademark debate. In fact, in the region here in South Asia, the debate about 3D marks is probably one of the more interesting debate Several countries are still in the uh, beginning phase of registering these marks. They are developing guidelines about how to register these marks. In some countries, we still are discussing the admissibility of these marks. 
And that is one of the reasons why, again, these are new marks as compared to those that are traditionally uh, registered, you know, uh, compared to the past many years. We have shape marks. We again have shape marks that can contain decorative element, um, words, or logos. We have position marks, marks that claim a specific feature as position on a specific part of the actual product. So the good, the good or the logo, you know, um, uh, that identify perhaps, you know, a certain type of service. Uh, we have pattern marks. Um, these are in some way, um, again, they're non-shapes, they are uh, bidimensional, but they're also um, marks that are more under discussion. You can see in these slides, the checker by Louis Vuitton, you might know perhaps uh, that this week, uh, the checker by Louis Vuitton was found to be a valid trademark, after consider, consider, considering um, uh, litigation in the European Union, for example. Another quite controversial categories of, again, I would say non-traditional trademark in my view, is the color, particularly the single color marks. Again, in the region, we don't see just now at this point um, admiss admissibility and registration of single color marks. While combination of colors um, tend to be more commonly registered, single color trademarks are still more controversial, for example. Then we have combination of colors with other type of marks, such as words or logos. For example, um, the Milka chocolate, the purple color with the Milka word and so on. Um, so, and this is a slide that come from the uh, European IP office. When we look at new type of marks, uh, the newest type of marks are certainly sounds, multimedia marks, motion marks, hologram, but I still consider, and I think here in the region, we should consider as non-traditional means different than the usual type of registration that we have, the shapes, the color, the shape containing colors, patterns, and so on. I was asked to talk to you about some of the latest developments, but I think we can't really go into development without reconstructing for a minute how we got here. The Paris Convention, which was the very first international agreement that create a minimum of harmonization um, in the um, area of trademarks across the member states and all members um, you know, of the region are member of the Paris Convention, did not include any specific definition of what is a trademark. It only included specific information and provision about what cannot be registered. For example, you know, heraldic, um, elements or national symbols, um, country retain the freedom not to register signs that are immoral or scandalous and so on. The first definition of trademarks that we have on an international agreement comes from the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property. That is the TRIPS agreement that was adopted in 1994 under the auspices of the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Article 15 of TRIPS provides for a broad definition of trademarks that is very much the result of many years of negotiation and clearly has the imprimatur of the American Landman Act definition as mixed with the European Trademark Directive um, definition both the first trademark directive, um, you know, the 1989 directive, um, along with the Landman Act, predate the TRIPS agreement. And the definition in TRIPS was including any sign that is capable of distinguishing products shall be capable of constituting a trademark. Such sign in particular, but of course not limited to, words, 
personal name, letters, numeral, figurative element, and combination of colors, as well as any combination of sign, shall be eligible for registration. In addition, members may require that a sign is visually perceptible, but they are not necessarily obliged to do so. Particularly, we have seen throughout the many years in the European Union, the requirement of graphical representation that is now being changed to visual perceptibility was a bit of a break in the registration of certain marks because the complication about how to represent them. But under the TRIPS agreement definition, which is really the umbrella that covers all trademarks uh, definition of all member states of TRIPS, there is no obligation to have any representation. And you see the definition is very broad. The next agreement um, under the WIPO um, umbrella again, that provides for information and specific um, guidelines about non-traditional trademarks is the Singapore Agreement on the Singapore Treaty on Trademarks. And the Singapore Treaty allows and um, specifies many of the details about the registration of non-traditional trademarks, even though it does not impose on the WIPO member states, uh, the Paris Convention member states, to use this type of mark but certainly facilitates uh, with very detailed um, um, provision about how to register um, this type of marks. So today, under this international framework, every type of sign can be registered. This can include words, include symbols, colors, single colors, product packaging, product configuration, retail store design, look and feel of websites, um, sound, scent, taste, textures, hologram, and movements. Even artistic works that were previously copyrighted can be registered and design up to a certain extent when they're found not to be functional. Of course, every single one of these marks have to be carefully examined and there are guidelines that offices and examiners follow to assess that the various requirements, distinctiveness, priority, lack of functionality, um, in many cases acquired distinctiveness are there in the application based on evidence before the offices do grant these trademarks. So briefly, how then the TRIPS agreement definition uh, was translated into the European Directive. This is the text of the new um, European Directive as revised in 2017 with the trademark reform packages. I want to briefly mention it to you to transition then to the more US style um, applications and examination, because again, the European Union, of course, you know, IPT is a project of the European Union, I'm not going to talk about the guideline of the UIPO that will be discussed by my co-speaker uh, later this week, but I think to look at the definition of the EU is really important. Under EU law, any mark make so a mark may consist of any sign, and you see here very much the TRIPS definition, and this definition starts in the EU and then went to TRIPS. Remember 1989. Um, uh, to the TRIPS agreement in 1994, any sign particularly consisting of words, personal name, design, letter, numeral, color, the shape of goods, or the packaging of goods, or sound, provided that such sign is capable of distinguishing the goods and services, and being represented on the register in a manner which enables the competent authority of the public to determine the clear and precise subject matter of the protection afforded to its proprietor. I know um, Indonesia, which is one of the country we are talking today, has changed its trademark law recently. Vietnam is looking at some changes in order to facilitate the registration of these marks. Other countries in the region have been adopting 
for example, Myanmar lately, um, you know, trademark bills. But this definition is a very useful definition for any possible legislative reforms or guide offices of guidelines in terms of what can be registered and what can be the scope of the type of registration, particularly, again, visual perceptibility, should a country be interested in having visual perceptibility. You can see the difference you know, between Article 3 of the current text and Article 2 of the previous text of the directive as in 1989 and then later revised in 2008. That was mentioning a trademark may consist on any sign, et cetera, et cetera, um, provided that such sign, again, are capable of distinguishing the goods and services of one undertaking from the other. So what does that bring us to? That bring us to um, registration such as the very famous Coca-Cola bottle. I think that one of the very first non-traditional trademarks, one that was refused back almost a century ago in the United Kingdom and now is registered in the United Kingdom was precisely the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle. Here you have the registration in the, in, in the European Union, for example. Um, the Lego figurines, uh, the little toys are registered also as a non-traditional trademark, as a shape mark in the European Union. Many of the perfume bottles, um, the Gucci stripes, this is a combination of color that gets attached to many goods and services. Um, Sweets such as um, you know the the marshmallow peeps, uh, posted the yellow posted, um, the decor of the Apple Store have been registered in the European Union after a decision of the uh, Court of Justice um, on remand by uh, the German uh, Courts and Patent Office. I think I want to show you this because in the US we have very similar marks. So when we also look at non-traditional trademarks or marks in general, as you know, often offices are registering across the world based on territoriality, marks that have already been registered also in other offices. And so the experience of other offices is always very important and very useful, not necessarily to do the same, However, as a point of reference, it's always useful and there is um, quite um, an amount of collaboration. Uh, again, the IPT um, initiative is very much about collaboration between IP offices and stakeholders specifically to maximize synergies between all these various uh, registration examiners and procedure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is you know, a slide that come directly from the UIPO. Uh, in the UIPO, uh, the Google Watch uh, for movement trademarks you know, was uh, protected. Um, then uh, this is a very uh, famous mark. This is a multimedia mark. It's a beeping heart um, that has also been registered in several countries. Um, and uh, this is, was my last example, again, to make a transition from the IP key, that is a European um, institution, you know, uh, from the UIPO, to the American system, that is the one I want to focus primarily on. Um, the Landman Act, as I mentioned before, uh, the Landman Act is the, um, uh, inter uh, the, the United States trademark law, was adopted in 1946 and has been um, amended several times. However, the definition of trademarks is really a very broad definition. It doesn't even include any type of graphical representation. Under the US law, marks can be words, names, symbol or device, or any combination thereof, used in commerce to identify and distinguish products and to indicate so. You can see this definition is broader than all other definition in that it identifies word, name, and symbols or device and combination thereof. And that includes a very broad scope for the subject matter that can be protected. America, on the other side, required until um, the TRIPS agreement, you know, until a few years before the TRIPS agreement, use in commerce 
for a mark to be registered. In fact, America still requires using comma for a mark to be registered. However, application to register a mark can be filed based on an intent to use with a, a statement of use uh, to be filed before the registration is issued and the time before the application based on bona fide intent to use and the actual submission of a statement of use can be no longer than three years, you know, six months uh, on six months increment. But the definition under US law is very broad. I'm going to discuss with you the guidelines, the guidelines that the examiners in the USPTO use for registering non-traditional trademarks. The guidelines are found in the Trademark Manual of Examining Procedure. They are very detailed. They include many of the recent case law or the less recent case law if the case law is still authority. Um, I have uh, uh, given a copy um, to the organizers um, to distribute whoever is interested. And uh, should you have any question, please feel free to reach out and I will be very happy to guide you to um, some of the specific points in the guidelines. This can be very useful again for other examiners and other IP offices and other stakeholders um, to be look at some, um, you know, to be look in some way, you know, as potential point of reference. So with respect to 3D, three-dimensional uh, trademarks, the guidelines of the USPTO said that an applicant must submit a drawing that depicts the mark in a single rendition. The mark description must state that the mark is 3D in nature. The 3D feature of the mark must be shown in the supporting uh, specimen of use in order for the drawing to comprise a substantial exact representation. They are, and I apologize, there is a mistake. I was editing the slides yesterday and the number should be 1,700 plus. Uh, live trademark registration that will be fixed before the slides will be uploaded. Um, these are just some examples, and I have many more uh, of registered 3D marks. Uh, the brown beer bottles, um, you know, translucent piggy bank, uh, packaging for mattresses, um, uh, you know, a, a, a rest for the shoulders. Um, you know, um, some uh, identification tag. Um, I know, I hope all of you are familiar with a quite uh, famous um, chocolate in uh, the United States, the Hershey Kisses. And this is a chocolate that is, you know, 3D registered. Uh, 3D registration are very much used in the confectionery um, world. Uh, Ferrero Rocher, um, you know, the, the, there have been lots of disputed over the shape of the Kit Kat, for example, whether that can be registered or not, and countries have decided differently based on various, uh, you know, various conditions. Um, the United States does protect the shape, Europe does not protect the shape of Kit Kat, South Africa protects the shape, Singapore does not protect the shape. Um, so you can see also how the same marks sometimes don't get the same assessment in all offices across the world. But the Hershey Kisses are registered in, 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 in the United States. The Coca-Cola bottle and many variations of it have been registered throughout you know, the years. And this includes also not just the Coca-Cola bottle, but also other bottles. Um, you know, the, the Crocs footwear, uh, the front part of the Jeep car, um, you know, uh, Mrs. Butterworth's container uh, has been registered. Uh, many of the bottles for uh, spirits or perfumes are registered um, in the United States. Um, so when you see a famous looking shape, uh, there is a very high likelihood that that shape is registered as a trademark in the United States USPTO registry. Uh, the Lego figurines, as they are registered in Europe, they are also registered in the United States. Um, there are many accessories in the fashion industries. Uh, this is one of the buckle of uh, Louis Vuitton uh, bags, for example, which is registered. The whole uh, shape of one of the iconic bags of Louis Vuitton 
uh, one of the very first and most famous bag of Louis Vuitton is Register. Uh, this is a bag that belongs to Hermès um, and is also, um, you know, Register. Um, Cartier and many jewelry um, register the shape or part of the shape of their jewelry or their watches, particularly the most iconic one. The boxes they work, uh, you know, they, they, they store and they, and they sell their um, the jewelry in. Again, packaging is a major part of marketing and trademarks indicate distinctiveness in the marketing um, of products and as long as a shape is distinctive of the commercial source, then the distinctiveness can function to make the, uh, that specific sign uh, registrable as a mark because it is distinctive of a specific commercial source. Um, this is, again is an example of Cartier um, registration for specific shape of a watch. Um, is, um, is another famous Cartier watch, as you can see again. Um, and the decor, so basically the trade dress of uh, the Apple store is registered in the United States as well. Now, moving to colors, uh, under the trademark manual of examine procedure, a registrability of color depends on how the color is used. The guidelines for colors are quite strict. A color takes the characteristic of the object or surface to which it is applied, and the commercial impression of a color will change accordingly. Color, and this is very important, are never inherently distinctive and have to prove, an applicant for a color have to prove acquired distinctiveness, or what we say in the United States, also called secondary meaning, um, through use. So how an applicant prepare the file is absolutely crucial. Why is because color are very scarce, you know, words are already, you know, there is not an infinite numbers. Um, the issue with registration of trademarks is always, you know, not just giving somebody the right, but also allowing competition in the marketplace and any exclusive right also from an examining PTO standpoint means that somebody else will not be able to get a similar mark of, you know, a similar name or similar sign for similar goods and services if there is a likelihood of confusion. And so examiners tend to be very careful when we grant trademarks because of, you know, the problems that that can create uh, by over granting trademarks in terms of potential cancellation later, but also harm to competition in the marketplace. And so colors tend to be fairly tricky and the PTO clearly does not allow colors also as per guidelines, unless there is a proof of acquired distinctiveness. These are some of the colors that are registered for La Bouton, Coca-Cola, uh, Home Depot, um, um, you know, Cadbury, T-Mobile, and so on. So I would say it's interesting, for example, Cadbury has the protection for the purple color in the United States that was denied for protection, uh, for example, in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, but again, the examining attorney must, under the guideline, refuse to register color on the principal register unless the applicant established that the proposed mark is acquired distinctiveness. The ground for refusal is that the color is not internally distinctive and thus does not function as a trademark. So you see it's quite stringent standard. Um, if a color, it's not um, you know, um, it, it's not distinctive, then the color can be registered only in the supplemental register. In the, in the United States, we have a primary register and the principal register and the supplementary register, but the strength of the principal register is stronger. And the applicant must demonstrate that the color has acquired source identi you know, identification. Otherwise, the mark cannot be registered if the mark is functional. If, for example, uh, light 
bright jackets for um, you know, uh, street workers. These are functional because that specific color reflects the light and uh, so keep these people safe while they do street works. Um, that is, or, you know, that's clearly functional and so cannot be protected. Um, these are just some examples. I'm going to show you more uh, specifically as well. But the Labouton shoes, uh, for example, um, you know, you might, you might recognize, you know, some of these trademarks. Uh, these are nice quizzes as well. Um, so, um, in addition, an applicant wants to have a mix, so a combination trademarks between colors and other graphical elements can do so. And so the examiners will look at the commercial impression. You know, the commercial impression of a color might change depending on the object to which it is applied. And granting, granting an application of color in the abstract without consideration of the manner of context will be contrary to law and public policy. This is written and it's really important to consider again from examiners. Um, for example, in the European Union, not very much, not even a year ago, a decision was issued over the Red Bull colors, the combination of gray and blue. Red Bull is, um, you know, of course, um, you know, a joint venture also with Thailand. And the reason why the European Union rejected the mark, eventually the court rejected the mark, is because it was not described in a way that was narrow enough. So the shade of the color was too broad and was not described in a way that was narrow enough for it to be registered. Some example of registered trademarks color in the United States, the Tiffany blue, that's really a one of probably of the most famous uh, trademarks. Um, uh, then, um, the Tiffany color, it's registered, you know, for multiple type of packaging and is uh, uniformly and consistently used um, as a source identifiers um, uh, throughout, uh, um, throughout the various, you know, the various products of Tiffany. Um, Hermes uses the orange. You might know the story, Hermes had to use orange during the war, World War II, because the packages were scarce and only in theory back then ugly orange packages had been left and so the company had either to use those color packaging or no packaging for their goods but then make them unique and distinctive and so today um, orange is clearly the landmark color of uh, their mess fashion house um, UPS, the combination of, you know, that very shade of brown uh, with the gold uh, uh, color for the UPS logos, it's a uh, um, register and uh, it's one, it's of course, you know, very iconic of the delivery services. Um, the color yellow and green for John Deere, it's also a very specific shade of green. It's also protected. Um, also posted, the yellow color is protected. Um, many of the fashion items, this is a Louis Vuitton bag, and what is claimed here is the wavy pattern with the yellow color. And we can see in the registry there is a series of these marks with different colors for the same patterns under the same trademark owner. Then moving to sounds, um, sounds, according to the trademark examining guidelines, can function as surf indicator when they assume a definite shape or arrangement and create in the mind of those who hear an association with goods and services. Sounds can be registered in the principal register when they are arbitrary, unique or distinctive, and can be used in a manner so as to attach to the mind of the listener and be awakened on later hearing in a way that would indicate for the listener that a particular product or services was coming from a particular source. 
uh, the lion roaring of the MGM um, you know, before a movie starts is probably one of the most famous sound trademark has long been registered in the United States. Um, you know, a series of tones and musical notes with or without words. Uh, and here again is how we register marks uh, because the United States requires specimen, but is not as strict in terms of vis visual representation. A combination of notes are not necessary. For example, um, you know, a tape with the music or, um, you know, a computer generated uh, sequence with the music are also um, considered to be indicative of the type of music. Words can also accompany the specific music. Example of sounds marks are, you know, goods that then makes a sound. Um, that you know, combination between a specific iconic uh, visual, you know, that can be, um, so it's, a, it's an artistic work, it can also be considered to be a, um, a logo and a sounds that is combined with it. You might remember the Intel Pentium, um, and other sounds that make a specific sound with the opening of a specific product or the interaction with that specific product. These are also very commonly, um, you know, a type of registration that make that sound even more distinctively associated with a specific source. And, uh, you know, what these are, you know, I think uh, an interesting um, uh, picture about the frequently uh, objection to sound trademarks, you know, the description, the failure to function that is not used really as a mark, but rather um, as an you know, aesthetic feature of decoration. Uh, the fact that it really doesn't identify good and services is used as such, but not to identify good and services. Um, there again, there is, there is a file specimen that is required. Um, sometimes the sound might be more functional. Uh, we can't really use a lion or an animal sound uh, for animal services, for example, you know, to use meow for uh, cat food uh, or, you know, the, the, you know, the sound of a dog, again, for cat food, for dog food would not be, that would be considered to be functional. Um, and there should be, of course, the declaration, so all the formalities um, as well have to be um, you know, have to be uh, complied with. Interestingly, um, you know, this is a case that was decided by the district court in the United States. One of the team, uh, you might know that the Americans, like many people in the world, but certainly American college um, is very much into sports. So the University of Arkansas as a team uh, called, uh, you know, the Razorback and uh, the Razorback uh, have uh, a specific, um, you know, items in some way, and then is who pig soy. And so that mark uh, wanted to be registered for apparels, uh, and the Board of Trustees opposed the registration uh, of that, and, uh, you know, by a third party. And the case settled uh, eventually, uh, there was really a material, a dispute of materials fact, can that be registered or not? So again, in the guidelines, you can find all this, this specification. Smells, you know, the scent of a product may be registrable if again is used in a non-functional matter. Scent the serve by utilitarian purposes, such as the scent of a perfume or an air freshener, are functional and not registrable. That's important is because perfume are protected often through trade secret, but their scent is very difficult to protect, even though it might be very distinctive. You know, certainly Chanel number no. five is a highly distinctive scent. Uh, certainly many perfumes are highly distinctive scent. That's how um, you know, they become famous in the first place because they have a specific distinctive scent. But that is often found to be functional and so not, depend, not possibly registrable because it's attached to the fact that the perfume has to have a specific scent to function as a product. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of these marks require uh, considerable evidence. So the prosecution file has to be very well prepared for the examiners to have a lot of evidence of use acquire distinctiveness and non-functionality.
uh, an individual perception of scent might also be different depending on the environment. People's skin react differently to certain substances, so the scent might be slightly different. And here again, as we've seen earlier with the colors, colors might change in shades. Even if it's the same blue, it might look a bit different depending on the object to where, you know, where the, that specific color is used. The scent uh, variation based on the products and the subject might become, are certainly even greater. And so again, here, the ability of the sign to function in a consistent way, because we know a mark has to be consistent, might become more difficult. Um, and so here again, these marks are possible to register, but they're not that many register because to overcome the burden of uh, proof to register is quite considerable. Uh, for example, you know, in the case Cheryl Perfume versus Revlon, without a universal method of identifying classified scent and given their subjective nature, consumers are bound to be confused as more scent enter the marketplace. And they're not able to distinguish them accurately. So again, here the office found that it was very complicated to actually go and register scent in practice. Sometimes one has also, from a business standpoint, to ask, why do I want to register the scent of my products uh, when it's going to be very difficult to enforce that mark? You know, because even just to find evidence of substantial, you know, of similarity and, and consumer confusion might become extremely difficult, um, you know, on, on an actual, um, you know, litig in a lit litigation setting. But there is a very famous mark that has been registered, the Play-Doh. Uh, the scent of the Play-Doh is being registered. This is a famous uh, kid's toy uh, that has a quite distinctive smell. And uh, uh, in 2017, uh, the mark was applied. And in 2018, the mark was approved. Uh, it, and the description is for a sweet, slightly musky vanilla fragrance with slight overtones of cherry combined with the smell of slate wheat-based dough. Mm, that's, you know, for the Play-Doh. Now, moving from smell to taste, uh, um, the, again, you see quite restrictive um, guidelines. A flavor can never be inherently distinctive because it's generally seen as characteristic of the goods. Uh, and, uh, you know, the board, the TTAB observed that is unclear how a fa flavor can function of a trademark. Um, an application to register a, fav a flavor requires quite substantial evidence as well and showing distinctiveness. In this specific case, uh, uh, this um, uh, spray uh, for a specific substance that is a treatment, uh, the registration to flavor and um, uh, for the flavor and scent uh, like peppermint of this, of this treatment, uh, was, uh, um, you know, was denied because, again, the idea that the examiners got and, you know, eventually the board and the courts got, basically the flavor enhanced the functionality of the product. And so, again, it's really difficult in, in practice to register scent and flavors, um, so in tastes and taste marks. There are some, very few, it requires a lot of evidence. They are um, uh, taken to much greater scrutiny and they are very difficult to enforce in practice. So this is also probably why there are less number of these marks. Gesture, uh, we have several gesture trademark in the U UIPO. Uh, I would say we have a bit less uh, in the United States here again. Uh, uh, we have, you know, less than 100 um, uh, registration. I will be also happy to um, share with you uh, how to search in the um, um, United States um, databases, the tests. Um, you know, of course, you know, I'm sure uh, those of you are examiners are very familiar with, the, with that, but um, you know, to look in, into these non-traditional trademarks, uh, the, the, the searching process is a bit more complex. But what is interesting about the finding of the, um, the, the marks uh, for gesture is that often they are combined marks. 
they are just sort of combined holding of the logo and so on. So then there is this combination makes the overall perception of the marks more um, distinctive uh, and so easier. Um, and uh, um, and so um, you know you see here you have um, in this specific one uh, the examiner the examining attorney found that the gesture was per se non permitted for example another example here of another gesture uh, that again um, um, you know uh, was not uh, was was eventually withdrew was filed but eventually withdrew. On the other side, and here's the last type of marks I'm discussing in the United States, and I'm about to close, uh, multimedia marks are well established in the United States. The specimen requires to have either a video clip, a series of still pictures, uh, a series of screenshots, but we have many marks, and I would say the Americans are the pioneers in these, you know, in these multimedia marks. Uh, the Lamborghini uh, uh, cars, uh, the movement of the, um, uh, the specific uh, doors is uh, protected. It's been canceled in the European Union, but it's still protected in the United States. Uh, these are some of the very old, uh, in many ways, uh, trademarks. So the 20th Century Fox and the Columbia uh, pictures have moving trademarks, have been registered for a long time. Uh, Walt Disney has a multi multimedia marks on the video clip of uh, uh, Williamson Boat that now it's also registered as a trademark and the opening of many of the Disney products and Disney movies. Uh, so again, here we are looking at signs that are distinctive, but the reality is a lot of distinctive sign can be trademarked. And this open up, particularly in the 3D space, some concern between overlap of design and 3D marks, and that's probably why certain offices are still on the fence about this registration, but there is also ways to navigate you know, a lot of these overlaps. So these are distinctive sign of trade. Some of these were registered or not, depending on the jurisdiction. They are distinctive design as well, and they are distinctive products. And so, to what extent we should be able to register through quite accurate and rigorous guidelines does remain a question for the IT offices. You know, so you know when we look at the ecosystem of trademarks, I think in, in IP, I think you know the role of trademarks is a very important one. And I want to close because I was able to gather through a very good friend of mine, Professor Henny Marlina and Professor Agus Arjona Universitat in, Universitas Indonesia, and through some of their contact at the DGIP, some example of trademarks, 3D marks and uh, sound marks in Indonesia. And here you see, uh, you know, an examples, uh, two examples, you see Ferrero Rocher shapes uh, or the light, um, you know, some of the spirits uh, registration, but also you see uh, 3D marks used for local businesses like La Salle Food Indonesia. Uh, this is, uh, these are two marks by Unicharm Corporation in Indonesia, uh, and these are additional two um, sounds marks by um, you know, to different businesses, uh, pharmaceutical company and department store. And so what conclusion is that these marks are a fascinating area and an area that is just destined to keep growing. And so we look forward, you know, the IP key uh, is very excited to be doing work in this area. This series of seminar follows a very a uh, wonderful conference that was hosted in Bangkok back in uh, October uh, 2019. And there is much more work to do. And I'm sure, uh, you know, IPT will be on the front line to do more work in this area, certainly. And so with that, I am very thankful to you. And I uh, remain uh, uh, available for your question now and also for your question later. You see my email here. Just feel free to send me an email in case, but of course, you know, please also, first of all, send any question to the IEP key general emails that has been distributed to you as part of this webinar. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Irene, for the excellent presentation.
Now we move on to the question and answer, but we will only be able to read some of the questions that were raised. So as I mentioned earlier, the questions that are not answered um, during the webinar will be um, answered via the website of the IP Key Southeast Asia. So we will post the answers there. Okay, first question, which you mentioned a, a, a while ago, but they would like to um, have more explanation on the difference between industrial design and the 3D mark. And um, a follow-up question, what is the advantage of registering a design? as a mark, as a 3D mark, rather than an, as an industrial design? Well, I assuming this question uh, uh, come from a practitioner. And uh, if you are a company, you want to try to get more protection for your products, particularly um, when your products are famous. Mm -hmm. You are Ferrer Rocher, uh, you are Hershey Kisses, um, you are, you know, some of the famous uh, suites um, in, uh, in, in, you know, in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Cambodia, in Indonesia. You might want to get protection for your shapes beyond design. Design expires within, depending the duration, you know, in Europe we have five years registration for a registered design that can be incremented up to 25 years maximum, but after 25 years, that registration expires while distinctive shapes under trademark law can continue to be protected beyond the 25 years. He said, as an advisor of policymakers and as somebody who cares a lot for competition, I am a bit torn by this question because the reality is in an ecosystem of um, IP for a, for a function, the overall shape of products has to be protected through design. Design is actually a stronger protection than trademark because the test for infringement doesn't include a likelihood of confusion. Um, and so for the first period is of course stronger protection than any trademarks. And eventually the rationale for design protection is that this, 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 you know, the protection and the design should go in the public domain, people should be, should be able to copy it. Um, and then what the original producer relies on is this trademarks to then, then identify the original design versus the copy. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's what happened with many products. On the other side, I empathize with the company and say, well, it's my very famous shape. Why should somebody else copying it if then it's this become distinctive of my, uh, you know, there is no doubt that the Kit Kat shape is very distinctive. Uh, should somebody else now the patent on the Kit Kat is expired or the design on that shape is expired, copying it? Well, trademarks might be a solution, and fair competition might also be a solution. So we don't need necessarily to have registration. But again, if I put my lawyer hat and I am uh, working for a company, I say, sure. I mean, I think you have to do the best interest of your clients. And so you have to apply for registration of the famous shape of your client because that will give longer protection. Um, it gives different protection to a large extent. It gives a bit weaker protection because the standard for infringement and confusion is more stringent. You have to prove likelihood of confusion. If it's really famous, you have to try, if you claim dilution, to bring a lot of evidence. Uh, the judiciary is still very skeptical about this, this overlap with design, so the likelihood of success in the court is not very high, you will run into competition issues, certainly. But some very famous world shapes, say the Coca-Cola bottle, at this point are quite well-established marks. So there is a value in doing that, but there is also a concern. The concern is not just from examining standpoint, it's also from company standpoint. If you look at the big uh, dispute between uh, Cadbury and Nestlé for, you know, color for purple color for chocolate versus the shape of Nestlé. 
you see this big, you know, this company, and it doesn't need to be a big company. You might just be a small business and you want to create a chocolate or any products of a certain shape, and suddenly you get cease and desist letters by all these others who say, I have a mark, I have a mark, I have a mark, and suddenly you can't you can have use any shapes or you really have to work around quite considerably because uh, all these shapes are taken. And so it's not just from, I am the company standpoint, I have an interest in getting a mark, but I also can find myself in the other, in the shoes of the other company as a lawyer too, saying, well, now I can't use almost any shape because everything is taken. Uh, or the most appealing shape, shapes are anyhow taken. We had discussion over shapes of bunnies for chocolate, you know, uh, for Easter bunnies, and that's a very functional shape, uh, teddy bears and so on and so forth. And so these are always double-edged sword. Yes, there is a major uh, strategic reason to have both, but at the same time, that strategy sometimes can, can backfire. And uh, um, so I think, you know, a lawyer has to be very careful. At the same time, of course, has to do the best interest of their clients. And offices have to be also very careful. And the more evidence are required for secondary meaning and acquired distinctiveness, the better, I think. And so the stricter the guideline, the better to really avoid issues uh, later on of cancellation or competition concerns. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, there is another question here on inherent uh, distinctiveness of marks, that some marks are not inherently distinctive. So please explain how a mark that is not inherently distinctive can be proven to have acquired distinctiveness through use, so if it's an, a non-traditional trademark. This is probably a more a question for the second speaker, but um, if you have some thoughts on this? Yes, of course. So, I mean, in the United States, uh, secondary meaning acquired distinctiveness is extremely important. In fact, as I mentioned, the system was designed not to register marks unless they were already in use. Then the system changed uh, because the rest of the world uh, was mostly based on a file system rather than a use system. Um, and so now in the US there is bona fide intent to use. But even that, as I mentioned, we need to have use in commerce before registration. And so how we can create a dossier for our trademarks that really prove distinctiveness is through quite an amount of use. And uh, um, you know, we know that consumer surveys might be uh, not necessarily well designed, but they're still useful to prove distinctiveness. Advertising and uh, you know how much a uh, degree of recognition of a certain products how is used uh, is it used iconically um, you know I would say there is no doubt that some of the famous shape uh, you know if, if if you look from far and you see a uh, triangular chocolate I think more more or less everybody will think Toblerone uh, you know a four finger shaped chocolate more or less everybody would think Kit Kat. Uh, we know that certain shapes are very famous because they've been used consistently. And so the more um, evidence of use um, throughout many channels, advertising, consumer surveys, um, actual product display, uh, that clearly indicates um, you know, an element to prove acquired distinctiveness. Inherent distinctiveness with respect to non-traditional marks tend to be a big problem because um, examiners are very concerned about granting rights that might be beyond the scope of rights you know and and i would say also offices in the past when these marks started to be to be registered in offices such as the uspto the, the, or the uipo we're a bit more liberal in granting these marks, but then we had several cancellation. In the European Union, we had the rubric cube uh, interface has been canceled. Now, even you know the the um, the, uh, the the colors for um, you know the the um, the beverage you know the the, the Thai beverages um, uh, was was canceled. Um, you know um, the Kit Kat. 
has been canceled, the Labouton shoes have been uh, uh, litigated and the marks have been canceled somewhere, they've been restricted. Um, you know, the Daimler check by Louis Vuitton was just found to be valid, but that also entailed a very long judicial battle. And so then guidelines, stricter guidelines have been uh, enacted in all IP offices to really create a bar at the entry so then secondary meaning, acquired distinctiveness is much more asked and so specimens and proof of, of acquired distinctiveness are more necessary precisely to avoid future cancellation because that becomes even more an additional problem on the system. Uh, it becomes a burden on litigant, it becomes a burden of, uh, you know, of, of people um, trying to register trademarks. And so I would say that is really how uh, the more used, the better, uh, the true use rather than trying to claim uh, things that are not necessarily in use, uh, the, uh, it's really important. And that goes back to the next seminars I'm going to give next week, you know, was about good faith, bad faith trademarks. Uh, you know, it's the fact of trying to just register every single shape somebody produces just, you know, um, uh, without uh, proof of secondary meaning, acquired distinctiveness, could, could it be considering bad face registration just because it's a run to monopolizing shape uh, across the boards? And I think uh, examiners are very concerned about that because, interestingly, some of the non-traditional marks, such as sound, scent, uh, they're far less problematic for competition than colors and shape. Color and shape remain the two most difficult trademarks because shapes and colors are scarce and they're used in every product. Um, and, and so that becomes uh, uh, much more a burden um, uh, for the applicants to really prove that what they're asking for is really distinctive of their goods. And I think it's a very fair trade-off. You want your shape, you can get your shape protected through trademarks for an limited amount of time through renewal of registration. You have to put together a quite solid dossier showing that there is distinctiveness um, and, uh, and that's proved through, you know, the more evidence, the better. Thank you, Rene. So we have um, time for maybe two to three more que short questions. Uh, and this one is related to your earlier explanation. So um, the, there is a request uh, for more information on how a color mark can be evaluated. So again, I think you know that goes to what you just said. A color mark will probably be evaluated. The more specific, the better. Um, I show you a picture of uh, the pattern, the wavy pattern of uh, Louis Vuitton bag. Um, and there is a series of marks um, on many colors that Louis Vuitton has claimed, but the description is extremely strict. It's the color yellow or the color blue or the color black as applied to a laser wavy pattern and so on. So the application is really for that specific shade as applied to a specific type of product on a specific type of material. And that is really important because again, to register color in a vacuum, as we have seen, even from the guidelines, the office is extremely strict. Colors are even more scarce than shapes. And so to try to register a color that creates monopoly for everybody else to be able to use becomes a problem. And it becomes also very difficult to enforce because one thing is the Tiffany blue that is really very iconic of Tiffany. But different is the Hermes orange. Orange Hermes is for bags of luxury goods and packaging of luxury goods. Hermes doesn't have any claim against Home Depot Orange because the goods are very different. Even if Hermes is certainly famous, Hermes will never be successful in any case, I would say worldwide in claiming that the orange is his color across the classification of goods and services. Instead, the orange is their color for packaging of specific luxury goods. If tomorrow, you know, a new jeans line starts, 
uh, of trendy jeans and they want to use orange bag and they don't even register because you know you know usually with a registration you can go after and register you know and just use uh, um, um, packaging or use other sign no court would say that a new business that does trendy jeans can now use uh, orange color bags um, you know particularly if there is the logo on top of these bags that is create zero likelihood of confusion while if a new luxury say Labutan tomorrow wants to use orange um, packaging that will clearly be seen as a likelihood of confusion and so infringement of your mess bag. So a lot of that is highly context specific and I would say um, it's important to protect against your, your competition in your market sector but it's very difficult to enforce beyond that because colors are very very limited and so the, their registration is very much um, um, uh, limited to um, specific, you know, to very specific um, shades and context. And again, I think from a competition standpoint, that's very legitimate. Thank you. One last question, because we're out of time. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, the look and feel of websites can be registered or it, um, have been registered in some jurisdictions. If you could please cite some examples. Uh, well, I would say it then goes goes you know with the with the trademarks um, uh, in general. You know when you look at uh, um, what you know good branding is uh, is to recreate a consistent image, and so your image keeps being portrayed uh, not just in the core of your stores. Uh, offline, but also in the decor of your website. That is certainly, it's, uh, you know, one of your major, particularly as we know now, uh, you know, when people can go out, you know, the, the window, the windows into, into shopping or the windows into buying is uh, certainly, you know, online. And so whether it is uh, uh, the green, think about in Indonesia, go Jack, go Jack, and all the look and feel of, you know, uh, the Gojek um, uh, website, that's clearly protectable, uh, which is different enough, I would say, now Grab, uh, it's green uh, and it's similar, but it's different enough not to be confusing. Um, Uber, uh, when we look at, you know, again, the online economy, some it's, you know, you portray your world offline and you replicate it online, but others is just you live online, you live online, you know, uh, think about uh, the Instagram interface, think about, uh, um, you know, the house party interface, all these are clearly protected. Now, the other thing about a lot of these, I think, interestingly, is that they start by being used and there is a lot of non-register protection going on, and then some of those can materialize in registration. Uh, I would say Disney um, is certainly um, um, a very major uh, player and you know, some of the, the famous trademarks. And when you look at their website, you see that there is a purpose uh, in replicating elements that are already embedded in their marks also as a part of the look and feel of the website. So again, trademark strategy comes in marketing. Marketing needs to be very well based with legal because it's how legal people who have a good understanding of artistic development, web development, marketing development can give the best suggestion to how to incorporate without becoming too technical because then too much trademark loading, it's also non-aesthetically appealing, but how to incorporate um, elements of function of the marks uh, in a way that use them distinctively, it doesn't change them because you know you we should not change the marks because then they're no longer used, you know, that we can actually run another problem, but how to incorporate consistent and distinctive element of our trademarks in all our sites as well. So I would say, you know, when we look at the UPS, uh, the WebEx, sorry, the, the FedEx, uh, 
uh, shipping services, uh, online, uh, um, um, you know, application for um, uh, food delivery or um, uh, transport services, payment services, bank services, and so on. You clearly see distinctiveness in their look and feel of the website. Uh, thank you very much, um, Irene.